testing and prevention. Thank you, Senator uh, Pratt. The time for this debate has now expired. Senator Scar. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Yesterday in this chamber, the Minister said, and I quote, we are a government that delivers on our commitments, every single one of them, end quote. Minister, if your government is one that delivers on its commitments, why have you scrapped your promise to reduce electricity prices for Australian families by $275? Thank you, Senator Scar, Minister. Uh, thank you, and thank you to Senator Scott for giving me the opportunity to talk about how we're delivering on our commitments to the Australian people. Uh, this is a government that, over the last six months, over the last six months, has got to work day one delivering on all our commitments, including in relation to our Renew uh, Powering Australia plan, which has significant, which has significant investments to fix the energy mess that we inherited after 10 years of denial, delay and dysfunction. And I'm not going to stop explaining to the people of Australia the situation that we inherited. Rising inflation, rising interest rates, a budget riddled with debt and deficit and pork barrelling and, and um, all the dodgy deals that have gone on and we have started unwinding all of that and responding to that. And in the budget, we had significant commitments into getting uh, our Powering Australia plan on the ground. Because let's not forget, nine years, 22 failed energy policies, none of them worked. We saw a three gigawatt decline in dispatchable power. That is under your record. We've got Snowy 2.0 running late. Uh, we had no, not one energy policy landed. And in the six months that we've been in charge, we have been investing in our Powering Australia plan. We've had um, Minister King deliver the supply that we need. We've had Ministers Bowen, the Treasurer and others to uh, deal with the, the gas crisis or the energy increases we've got. And we stand by the fact that renewables are the cheapest form of energy. They are the cheapest form of power and that increasing our investment in renewables will decrease energy prices. Uh, Senators, <coughs> Senator Scar, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Minister, yesterday you also said, we are not a government that breaks promises, end quote. If that's the case, will electricity prices be $275 lower for Australian house households by the time of the next election? Thank you, Senator Scar, Minister. Thank you. Well, we will deliver our Powering Australia plan, which is the promise we took to the Australian people. It was supported by modelling done in 2020 about energy prices in 2025. Our commitment is to deliver the plan we took to the election. That is exactly what we are doing with our investments that we have made in the budget, in Marinus Link, in renewable energy zones, in offshore wind, in pumped hydro, in community batteries, in solar banks. All of that progressed in our first opportunity through our first budget. That is what a responsible, mature government does, delivering on our promises, responding to the economic circumstances of the time, delivering a sustainable and responsible budget and delivering on those election uh, commitments. Uh, <coughs> Minister, Senator Birmingham. Pre President, on the matter of direct relevance, uh, Senator Scar has asked directly about an element of the Powering Australia plan being the government's commitment to reduce power prices by $275. The minister may be being broadly relevant talking about the plan, but he was asking about a specific element of it, and I ask you to draw the uh, minister to you. be directly relevant. <laughs> thank to you, the Senator Birmingham. Um, I do uh, advise the Senate that uh, at the start of this question there was a, a broader statement about promises generally, and I do believe that the minister is being relevant. Uh, thank you, Senator Birmingham. <coughs> minister. Uh, thank you. We will deliver on our Powering Australia plan, which uh, 
sets out all of our commitments as an overarching document, and we've made a cracking start of that in the first budget. Thank you, Minister. Senator Scar, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, President. I note the minister has not referred to the magic $275 number. Why won't you just admit that your government does break its promises and within just a few months has abandoned, has abandoned its election promise to deliver a $275 electricity price reduction for Australian households? Minister. Well, the question and the proposition outlined in the question is simply wrong. We are delivering on our Powering Australia plan and, and the uncomfortable Order. truth, Order. the uncomfortable truth, Matt President, Order. that Senator Scar is refusing to acknowledge is the chaos dysfunction that we inherited from you. So we are not only delivering on our Powering Australia plan, we are also fixing the mess that they left fixing the mess in the energy markets that you left where the lights were going to go out, where there wasn't enough supply and the, and the energy increases that you hid before the election—20 per cent increases. So we are fixing supply. We are working on how we can manage downward pressure on energy prices. We've been up front with the community about the situation we are facing, and at the same time, whilst fixing up all your mess, we're delivering on our commitments. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Grogan. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, uh, Senator Watt. The Liberals and Nationals said that low wages were a deliberate design feature of their economic strategy, and sadly it was the only strategy that they delivered. Um, now that Australians are feeling the crunch of cost of living um, rises and stagnant wages, can you outline the government's workplace relations policies, how they will actually help Australians deal with the cost of living and why this is actually important? Minister. Uh, President, and thank you, Senator Bro Grogan. I would love nothing more than to explain how the government's workplace relations policies will help working people get ahead in life. Because I think one thing most Australians can agree on is that the workplace relations system in our country is not working for workers or for employers. It's not delivering the fairness, the gender equality, the productivity gains or the economic growth that Australia needs. But the Albanese government's workplace bargaining policies will get wages moving again. That's something Australian workers desperately need after nearly 10 years of low wages under those who sit opposite and still haven't changed their ways. The fact that this was, in their own words, a deliberate design feature of the previous government's management of the economy will uh, be reminded of for many years to come. This shows how little those opposite think of workers in this country, and their contributions to the public debate on our policies have shown that nothing has changed. It's the same old, same old from the Liberal and National parties in this country. The Albanese government's package has been designed to lift the wages of Australian workers by putting job security and gender equality as objects of the Fair Work Act, by creating a pay equity expert panel and a care and community sector expert panel to particularly assist women uh, and those working in the care economy. Uh, we'll also make flexible work arrangements much more accessible and prohibit pay secrecy clauses so people, in particular women, are free to talk about their pay at work. We'll place limits on the use of fixed-term employment contracts so people don't get stuck on endless probation. We'll sunset substandard work choices era zombie agreements. We'll ensure the agreement termination process is fit for purpose and fair. We'll ban job ads that pay less than the minimum wage. We'll make the better off overall test simple, flexible and fair. And we'll improve access to single and multi-employer agreements because bargaining delivers for workers and businesses. If you're serious about fixing the cost of living, you need to get wages moving Thank for all Australians, Minister, and that's exactly what we'll do. Senator Grogan, first supplementary. Uh, can the minister outline how the government workplace relations policies will support businesses to avoid a race to the bottom on wages? Minister. I can, Senator Grogan, because we want to make more agreements that benefit both employers and workers. I understand that the concept of workers and, and businesses coming to agreements is something that the opposition just cannot get its head across, but actually it can be done. And importantly, we want to stop the race to the bottom by those who undercut businesses who are genuinely trying to do the right thing by their workers. Let me give you one great example of businesses who are embracing this new era of workplace relations that will benefit workers and employers. 
As, re as reported this morning in the Financial Review, the Heating, Ventilation and Air Conditioning Manufacturing and Installation Association has wasted no time starting their multi-employer bargaining. And we hear the laughter and the scoffs from those on the other side that there might be employers who actually want to come to agreements. Well, this, this, this group met the AMWU on Monday to discuss ways to use the new laws to deliver higher pay and standards for staff. This is what the Albanese Labor government wants to see more of employers, unions, and workers coming together to deliver a win win. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Grogan, second supplementary. Uh, can the minister outline why it is urgent that the government acts on this workplace relations policies as a priority? Thank you, Senator Grogan, Minister. I can, Senator Grogan, because it is urgent that we get wages moving again. And we understand from all the public debate we've seen over the last few months, backing in the last 10 years of inaction and deliberate design features of economy being low wages, uh, that for the opposition it's never the right time for workers to get a pay rise. It was never the right time during the 10 years they were in office. It's not been the right time now that they're in opposition. Well, we've had enough. Workers have had enough. It's time to get wages moving again. The best way to do this is by encouraging more agreements to be made and stop a race to the bottom on wages. It's good to see that Senator Colbeck has got a little bit of fight left in him because no one else on the other side does. <laughs> Australian workers have waited long enough, and while waiting they have turned up every day and done their job. Order. See, Richard, I knew, Senator Colbeck, Order. I knew you could be an example for your colleagues. It's now, workers have been waiting, they've been turning up every day and done their job. It's now time we did ours and legislated for secure jobs and better pay. Labor cares about working people. We care about giving them Thank a pay you, rise Minister, so they can keep up with the rising. Uh, Senator Dean Smith. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. I refer to comments by the Assistant Treasurer reported in the Sydney Morning Herald on negotiations between the government and the Greens on the Financial Accountability Regime Bill. Mr Jones, the Assistant Treasurer, said there had been no sign-off on anything. Yet last week in the chamber, Senator McKim stated, there is absolutely no doubt that Minister Jones and I had an agreement and any, and, and any claim that there was no agreement is false. Minister, can you clarify for the Senate, was there an agreement between Mr Jones and Senator McKim? And if so, why did the Assistant Treasurer renege on this deal? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, and I thank uh, Senator S Smith uh, for the question. Uh, and I don't think it's any secret in this place that we work um, across the chamber negotiating uh, legislation, possible amendments. Uh, we work collegiately where we can. Uh, that is our preference. We want, we want to Order. get legislation through. We've got a government um, for the first time in— um, Minister, oh. please resume your seat. Senator Smith. In of order, President, the question was very specific. Was there an agreement? Uh, and there was also a preamble <coughs> at Senator Smith, so I will listen carefully to the minister, and if she's uh, not getting to the point of the question, I will draw her to it. But at the moment, uh, she is being relevant, Minister. Did you agree with the Thank you. There were discussions, um, as you know, during through the week around a whole range of uh, pieces of legislation, including with the Greens, on a number of pieces of legislation. On a number of pieces of legislation. In respect to one element of those, there is more work. There is more work uh, to be done before we could finalise a position. We have explained that to the Greens. Order. We have explained that to the Greens about the work that needs to be done from from the government's point of view before we can reach agreement on one of those bills. Uh, and we appreciate the engagement. Uh, of the Greens in assisting us with our legislation this week and with all colleagues in the chamber. Oh, I'm sorry. Minister Gallagher. Senator Smith. President, with 45 seconds to go, I remind Senator Gallagher hmm? that the question was specific. Yeah, what's what's was your point of order? Was there an agreement? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Smith. The minister is, has gone to the question of an agreement, Minister. Thank you. We weren't able to reach a final agreement on that bill, and there have been discussions amongst the parties about how best to proceed uh, where there isn't 
agreement um, that could be finally reached to progress the bill in this chamber. There had been discussions, and I accept that there is more work to be done. And I, I um, thank Senator McKim for his. I thank Senator McKim for his engagement. I would also point out. Order. I would Order. also point out. This is cleaning up again Order. the legislation we are working on. Remember when you voted how many? 26 times against a royal commission into the banking and financial sector. Uh, this is actually progressing the outcomes Thank of you, that. Thank you, Minister. Your work. time has expired. Senator Smith, first supplementary. Thank you, President. The Assistant Treasurer had a subsequent blunder yesterday when the government moved an amendment to a government bill being managed by the Assistant Treasurer that was identical to an opposition amendment the government had opposed in the House of Representatives. Has the Treasurer or his office met with the Assistant Treasurer to counsel him on parliamentary process, uh, legislative uh, management— Smith, please resume your seat. Uh, Minister Wong. Uh, I submit that that question <laughs> is not a supplementary question. Uh, Senator Birmingham. Order. 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 I'm waiting. Uh, Senator Wong, I've called Senator Wong. I've called Senator Wong. I've called Senator Birmingham. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, President. Uh, on the point of order, uh, wide latitude was granted to the minister in answering the primary question. Correct. Wide latitude to talk generally about yes. deals and about conduct. Uh, this goes very clearly to the conduct and capability of the assistant treasurer, who seems to be an ongoing embarrassment for the government. Uh, Senator Birmingham, I. Um listened carefully to the points that were made, and uh, I am advised that it is not a supplementary question. Um, so, Wong, uh, Senator Wong, if I, if I can finish, order, order. As Senator Birmingham, I'm going to finish my point of order. Um, as Senator Birmingham said, uh, often latitude is given, and latitude can be given on this occasion, but it is up to the minister whether she answers the question or not. And I'm going to invite uh, Senator Smith to finish asking the question. Shall I start again, President? Yes. Uh, order. Minister Wong. I just suggest that we're happy to give leave for him to rephrase the question. In your hands, Senator Smith. Has the Treasurer or his office met with the Assistant Treasurer to counsel him on parliamentary process, legislative management, or how to conduct negotiations with par parliamentary colleagues in good faith? I think that I. In Thank you. I'll give the Minister the opportunity to answer it. Particular piece of legislation. Can I just say that uh, Minister Jones is an absolutely fine minister and an outstanding person and a good friend of mine. And I have known him since I was 25 years old. And Five he, years ago. <laughs> yeah, just just a couple of summers ago, just a couple of turns Order. around the clock. Order. He he has hit the ground running again, cleaning up nine years of waste of wasted Order. time, of work that was left undone, of recommendations that weren't followed through, and he is putting through a legislative agenda that we are working through, including Order, probably Senator each June. sitting week in this place. Um, now, I have no doubt uh, that um, Minister Jones, in his work with stakeholders, in the work that he will do to finalise the position to consult further will include consultations with the Greens and with others to look uh, at how we you, can Minister. get Your legislation progressed. Senator Smith, second supplementary. It's hit the ground running and fallen over. Given it is clear, given it is clear that the Assistant Treasurer is not capable of managing Treasury Order. legislation, conducting negotiations, managing stakeholders or administering his portfolio, does the Treasurer retain confidence in the abilities of his assistant Treasurer? Uh, thank you, Senator Smith, Minister. It's the first half of that question, but I answered it in the second uh, question, which is Minister Jones is an outstanding minister and a fine colleague 
who works day and night in his portfolio. There are a lot of stakeholders. There's a lot of different views in this sector. I've had the shadow portfolio. It is not an easy portfolio to manage. There are stakeholders. There are different points of view. It's got a heavy legislative focus. It involves lots of engagements um, across the financial services sector, from the big banks to the consumer representatives and everything in between. Um, and he is doing an outstanding job in, deli in delivering on the government's agenda the reforms that we want to see done. And in the case of the legislation that Senator Smith's original question related to before he veered off track, there is more work to be done to reach agreement about how to progress that through the Senate, including talking with stakeholders. And that was the decision uh, that the Thank government you, took this Your week. Your time has expired. Senator Wish Wilson. President, before I start, or well, before you start the clock ticking over, and I'm sorry if I've missed it, I just wonder if we could acknowledge the visiting New Zealand delegation of parliamentarians in the chamber today? Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Wish Wilson, and I do acknowledge the, our visiting um, delegation from New Zealand and welcome to the Senate. They are missing the Greens, but they're still very welcome. Uh, thank you. <laughs> now, your question, thanks, now, um, Senator I, My question is to uh, Senator Wong, representing the uh, Climate Minister. Minister, another UNESCO scientific report has recommended that the Great Barrier Reef be put on the World Heritage in Danger list because its outstanding universal values are threatened by climate change. Right. In responding to the report this morning, the Environment Minister, Tanya Plibersek, publicly acknowledged we need to keep warming below 1.5 degrees to save the Great Barrier Reef. Mm. Minister, your government's legislated 43 per cent emissions reduction target by 2030 is consistent with two degrees of global warming, and the science tells us this is a death sentence to the reef as we have known it. Yep. Millions of Australians who love the reef won't be fooled by this apparent cognitive dissonance. Minister, what is it going to be? A climate plan that limits global warming to 1.5 degrees and gives the reef a chance, or two degrees and a death sentence for the reef as we have been lucky enough to have known it in our lifetimes. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Minister. Uh, the, uh, th this government was elected uh, with a plan to take strong action on climate, and that is what we will do. This party, over many decades, uh, many years, over a decade, uh, has had a very clear ambitions and strong position on climate. And, and we have not just talked about it. We, we won government uh, and we delivered. We delivered uh, action on climate. Regrettably, we lost government, uh, and we were, we, it, it, it has been a number of years, nearly 10 years, not only of inaction but of denial and delay and dysfunction on that side of the parliament. And Australia is poorer for it. Australia is the poorer for it. Uh, uh, I, I am asked about the 43 per cent target. We were clear with the Australian people before the election. Uh, and I would make the point uh, that that is that is uh, that is uh, uh, consistent with a net zero by 2050 position that we also uh, have been committed to. We've been committed to. Now it is the case uh, that this we have. Uh, uh, well, I make two points about the Great Barrier Reef. Um, the first is uh, that. The first <laughs> Senator Canavan. I, I've been having to present this Canavan to me. I'd make two points about the Great Barrier Reef. Firstly, obviously climate is, is, is a risk to all of our, of, of our natural environment. We know that. Uh, we, we've been told that. That is why we need to take the action we are taking. That is why we need to work as we did at the previous conference of the parties. I know those opposite don't like to hear this, as to Minister Bowen did at the conference of the parties to ensure there is no backsliding on the Glasgow commitments, and we, we maintain the ambitious position uh, and continue to build Senator on Rennie. the position uh, that was agreed in Glasgow. Uh, we also have a lot of work to do in our domestic economy, and the government is committed to doing Thank so. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Wish Wilson, first supplementary. There are 114 new fossil fuel projects awaiting approval in Australia. Minister, do you agree that every new fossil fuel project approved is a nail in the coffin of the Great Barrier Reef? How can we save the reef and keep warming to 1.5 degrees if we are actively and deliberately making climate change worse? 
Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Minister. I don't accept the premise at the end of that question, which suggests that a government that is willing to work with the Australian people to, to shift this economy from being one of the most emissions intensive economies in the world to a 43 per cent reduction by 2030 uh, and a 2050 reduction. Uh, a, a, net zero, a net zero by 2050. And it might be. You see, the thing about the Greens is they think you can say a target and will be delivered. Order. You say a target and it will be delivered. You see, we actually understand there are workers and industries and communities and people who have to be part of this journey. We all Order. have to change. We all have to change. And I am Order. grateful, as I've said previously, that the, that the Australian people have elected a parliament and a government that is willing to act on climate, and we will, and we will. And no amount of coming in here and, and asking questions like that, which suggests that we also don't care, will, will, derive, will detract from the fact that we are serious Thank about you, Minister, taking your action, time and has we expired. will. Senator Wish Wilson, yes, second supplementary. We'll find out how serious you are very soon, Senator Wong. Minister, the previous Morrison government went to extraordinary and shameful lengths to lobby, deny, dodge and deceive the international community and prevent an endangered listing of the Great Barrier Reef by the UNESCO World Heritage Committee. Will your government do the same or do you now accept the reef's outstanding universal values are in danger in line with this morning's released report? Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Minister Wong. Well, order. Uh, and we'll as the Environment Minister made clear Senator today— Canavan. Senator Canavan. Minister Wong, please resume your seat. We'll just... Senator Wish Wilson, you've asked your question to Minister Wong. She was on her feet with an answer, but there was so much interjection across the chamber. she could not. Senator Canavan, you were one of the people I just called. Minister, please continue. Uh, uh, well, Mr. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, look, the, we understand uh, the position in relation to the uh, Great Barrier Reef. I'll just make a, the point that I understand the report is not an endangered listing, it's advice to the World Heritage Committee, and obviously the mission report is one source of information that will inform UNESCO's advice to the committee about the state of conservation of the reef. Uh, as you know, uh, Ms Plibersek said this morning, uh, you know, we understand, and those opposite might like to deny it. We, wow. Senator, uh, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Wish Wilson. President, I asked whether. Uh, Senator, what the is your point, point of relevance? I asked the minister, minister, the senator, whether they were going to back the previous government's stance on denying the uh, UNESCO report and the advice thank you, on Senator the Barrier Reef being in danger. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. There was. An enormous preamble also to that question, and, and the minister is being relevant. Minister, I, I was directly responding that the mission report is one source of information that will inform UNESCO's advice to the World Heritage Committee about the state, state of conservation of the reef. Uh, I was also referencing the Environment Minister's statement this morning that, unlike those opposite, we don't deny that climate change has an effect on the reef and on all of our natural Thank environment. Thank you, Minister. And Your time has expired. Senator Green. Um, Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Minister, how will an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice help close the gap in life outcomes between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians? Minister. Thank you. Uh, uh, and I thank Senator Green for her question. I thank the many senators across this place, uh, on, on this side of the chamber, but not only, who have sought to engage with this important reform respectfully uh, and in a non-partisan way. Uh, President, we know that the gap in life expectancy between non-Indigenous and Indigenous Australians is unacceptably wide—7.8 years for women, 8.6 years for men, and no, no, none of us should accept this. I think all of us should recognise that decades of failed government policies have failed First Nations peoples and failed to close the gap. And this is precisely the point about the proposed voice to the parliament. It came about because Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people wanted a greater say in the matters that affect them. Matters that affect them. 
They wanted to be, want to be empowered to take control of their own lives, not have policies and laws dictated to, the, dictated to them by politicians and bureaucrats in Canberra. Uh, the Voice is about enabling a better future that will improve the lives of Indigenous Australians on the ground, in communities, in practical ways. Better outcomes in health, education, housing. Because we know from experience that you cannot create better policy and close the gap without listening to and hearing the voices of our First Nations people. The solutions to so many challenges are to be found in those communities, not in Canberra. And the voice will make sure those solutions are heard by policy makers here in the parliament. I note the decision of some opposite to oppose the voice before they've even seen the legislation. And the argument seems to be, we need change, so let's keep doing more of the same. Well, Australians know that does not make sense. And it is ultimately the Australian people, not the politicians, who will decide this referendum. And I believe Australians want to see a better future Thank for you, all Minister, Australians. Your time has expired. Yeah. Senator Green, first supplementary. Thank you, President. How will the voice ensure the views of First Nations peoples in remote and regional Australia are heard? Minister. <clears throat> Uh, thank you uh, to Senator Green for her supplementary uh, question. Uh, let's remember this. The Uluru, Uluru Statement from the Heart was the outcome of 12 regional dialogues. 12 regional dialogues in places like Dubbo, Broome, Ross River, Cairns, with representatives from right across remote and regional Australia. So the arguments that some make, somewhat mischievously, that this is all about what people in the cities want isn't correct. They aren't no, correct. No, proud, the the Uluru proud. statement from the heart was an historic Order. First Nations consensus. Order. Uh, uh, the Uluru statement from the heart was an historic First Nations consensus on the way forward, and as part Order. of that, the voice to the Parliament. Minister, the voice please resume your seat. The interjections across the chamber are disorderly. I have the minister on her feet answering her question. Order. Order. Please continue, Minister. Um, oh, you're here. Minister, Senator Payne. Yes. Motion to language sure. used by a senator. It's not acceptable to swear across the chamber. Uh, senator, order. Order. Thank you. Um, I did not hear that interjection. I am going to ask the senator to withdraw, but I'm also going to ask senators to listen with respect. Senator Chisholm. Withdraw. Thank you. Minister. Thank you. The Uluru Statement from the Heart was an historic First Nations consensus on the way forward. And as part of that, the voice to the parliament will make sure voices in rural and regional communities are heard on policies you, and Your on laws. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Green, second supplementary. Thank you. Minister, what are the next steps on the road to a referendum on an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice? Minister. Uh, thank you uh, to Senator Green. Uh, a bill to update the Referendum Machinery Act will shortly be introduced to the Parliament. This will take into account advice from the Referendum Working Group, which has set out key principles for the voice, voice which Senator Dodson has spoken about in this place, including that it provides independent advice to the Parliament and the Government, it is chosen by and representative of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. It is, it is empowering, community-led, inclusive, respectful, culturally informed and gender balanced and includes youth, is accountable and transparent and works alongside existing structures. Let us remember what was said in the Uluru Statement from the Heart. This is what was said to the nation. We seek constitutional reforms to empower our people and to take a rightful place in our country. When we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish, they will walk in two worlds, and their culture will be a gift to their country. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister of Immigration, Minister Watt. Many would have seen the hundreds of people uh, gathered out the front of Parliament House rallying against the government's failure to take action so far to address the truly heartbreaking plight of people languishing on bridging visas. In the gallery is Zahara, who I sat down with 
this morning to hear her story. Zahara is a refugee from Iran who was part of the first family sent to Nauru last time Labor was in government. Last year, Zahara's eldest daughter, Saha, finished school and won a scholarship to study at the Newcastle University. She started studying this year, but after seven weeks, <coughs> the government took her study rights away and she had to leave because she turned 18 and was on a bridging visa. Minister, why won't the government let Saha follow her dream to become a human rights lawyer and complete her studies? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister Watt. Um, thank you, Senator Pocock, for your question. And uh, Zahara and Saha, welcome to uh, the Senate. Um, it's terrific that you've been able to join uh, everyone here today. Um, the the, our government has obviously put forward a range of policies uh, for how we intend uh, to deal with people who are on bridging visas, in addition to people who continue to be in offshore processing, uh, particularly in Nauru. Um, these are very difficult issues, and I understand the difficulties that it causes, no doubt, to Zahara and to Saha and the rest of their family. Um, but these are issues that we are trying to balance uh, with a range of other factors. Um, to make sure that the policies that we do ultimately bring in uh, are, are enduring uh, and can remain in place into the longer term. So this does take some time, uh, and I understand that that does leave some individuals in difficult circumstances. And again, uh, I, I understand uh, that that is not an easy situation. Uh, Senator Pocock, as you may know, um, in my work career before I came here, I did quite a lot of legal work with refugees, and I know, I know there are other members in this chamber who have done the same thing. So um, we do, I can assure you, understand the personal difficulties that these situations cause. Uh, but we are weighing up a range of factors, uh, and I do hope that we can come to a resolution of these issues as quickly as possible um, so that people like Zahara and Saha uh, are relieved of the burden that they're currently under. Thank you, Minister. Senator Pocock, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Uh, thank you, Minister. Given these families have been living with so much uncertainty for so long, uh, are you able to inform uh, the Senate and, and Zahara when people like her who have been living in our community, working and paying taxes, will have their migration status finally resolved? What, what is the timeline? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister. Thank you, uh, Senator Pocock. Again, I obviously can't give a particular time frame for particular individuals, but one of the issues that we have had to deal with since taking office is the outrageous backlog in visa applications that existed under the former government. Uh, I, was, I, was shocked. I was shocked when we came to office uh, that the backlog in visa applications had blown out to nearly a million in this country. And that compares when we lost office in 2013, there was a backlog of about 200 odd thousand. It had blown out under the former government to nearly a million. Uh, and this is, affecting, this is affecting a range of people in our community. It is no Order. doubt affecting Zahara and Saha and her family. It is affecting a large number of other people on bridging visas. It's also impacting employers, in including in industries like agriculture, in manufacturing and many other industries who cannot get the workers that they need because the backlog is so long. We have applied increased resources to the Immigration Department to clear that backlog, and it's now down be well below 900,000. It's something thank we you, intend Minister to pursue. Watt, your time has expired. Senator Pocock, second supplementary. Thank you, President, and, and thank you, Minister. Uh, Minister, apart from pointing to the backlog, what is the reason that the government has taken six months to put forward some clarity on an election commitment? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister. Um, again, Senator Pocock, I do understand that people who are waiting for visa applications uh, to be processed, um, that is a really difficult situation for people to be in. Uh, and, and as I say, uh, as well as impacting on those people who are waiting for those applications to be uh, processed, it's, it's impacting on employers all around the country who are desperate to get workers who have been waiting for their visas to be processed for a very long time. Uh, and for all the complaints we hear from people on the other side about what needs to be done to assist regional employers get the workers they need, they did nothing about the visa backlog. And it's also, of course, impacting on the very people that you're asking about. Uh, we, at the Jobs and Skills Summit, 
we committed to uh, put on about, I think it was 500 extra immigration staff to help clear that backlog, in addition to the work that had already, already been done. And it's because of that we've now been able to bring that backlog down to 800 odd thousand from the nearly 1 million we inherited. It's still too long. We're still putting in more resources and hopefully that will make a difference to the people that you're asking questions about. Thank you, Minister. Senator Davey. Thank you very much. And I'm glad the minister has been talking about um, workers in the regions because my question is to the same minister, but with his emergency management hat on, Senator Watt. Um, minister, in estimates, I asked you whether the regional small business support program was to be continued after the um, end of the current round of funding on December 31st. Your answer at the time was that you were considering your options. Uh, minister, what are those options? Uh, thank you, Senator Davies. Minister Davies, sorry, Minister. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Davies. I presume the program you're talking about is the Regional Small Business Support Program pilot, uh, which was a form of uh, financial counselling uh, that was offered. Um, I think originally after the bushfires is when it actually started, but certainly it's been going for a couple of years. Um, as I indicated to you at estimates, that was a matter that we were giving consideration to because the former government, uh, despite saying that they thought this was a really important program, only decided to put money in the budget through to the 31st of December this year. Um, so I don't quite understand why the former government that you were part of uh, decided to have a funding cliff for this service, given that you thought it was so important. But be that as it may, again, that's something that we've inherited. Uh, and I recently, I recently approved an extension of that service to the 30th of, to the, sorry, to the 31st of March 2023, so that these uh, uh, services had funding certainty to carry them through the high-risk weather season. Uh, now, as I'm not sure, Senator Davey, whether you're aware, but. Uh, your, your, the former government, of which you were a part, actually commissioned a review of this service, which found uh, that rather than the service primarily being used by businesses who were suffering from the impact of natural disasters, uh, in fact it was mainly being used uh, to deal with issues arising from COVID-19 and the impact on businesses from that and also uh, from uh, other matters as well, and certainly not the kind of uh, floods that we're seeing at the moment. But we decided, regardless of the findings of the review, that it was important to give those services certainty. It was important to give their clients certainty, and that's why we extended it until the 31st of March next year to carry them through this disaster season. Uh, those services that have funding remaining at that point in time will be able to continue it beyond the 31st of uh, March till the 30th of June next year. And in the meantime, we are giving thought uh, to what other services and funding could be provided to provide the kind of financial counselling that you're talking about. But it would have really helped if the funding didn't come thank out you, on the 31st of December Senator in the first place. Senator Davey, first up. Uh, thank you very much. And, and I would say, you know, we were expecting to be able to do a MyEFO, which could have addressed that. Um, we appreciate hearing that it's extended to the 31st of March. Um, I, I am amazed to hear that you don't consider COVID-19 a disaster for small businesses. Um, Minister, you have uh, in your possession a letter written to you by the New South Wales Rural Financial Counselling Service uh, Director. Senator Davey, your time has expired. Minister Watt. Um, I don't think I got a question there, President, but I'm, I think I know generally where it was heading. Yeah. Minister. To finish the question. Uh, leave's been granted for you to finish the question. I really appreciate that. How will hundreds and possibly thousands of farmers and rural small businesses be assisted if these financial counsellors are not funded to continue their work post what you've now confirmed 31st of March 2023. Thank you, Senator Davey. Minister. Plated in your last budget. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Davey. And as I say, this program was initially uh, created to assist small businesses who were uh, suffering financial impacts of drought or uh, natural disasters. And as I say, the review that was commissioned by the government of which you were a part found that in actual fact, most people were using it for the business impacts of COVID-19, which is not what the service was provided for. Um, but I had the option of pursuing what your government 
had put in place, which was to cut the funding out at the 31st of December. But my view was that it was important that those services and their clients had certainty to carry them through the disaster season, which is why we have made extra funding available to carry them through that season. That's not what your government did. Your government, in all of its budgets, didn't extend the funding beyond the 31st of December. Uh, so, um, the, uh, so we are continuing that service. And you mentioned farmers, Senator Davey. Um, there's actually a separate funding program available for rural counselling for farmers, and that remains in place. There is no risk to that funding at all, uh, and Thank you shouldn't you, be Minister, mixing your up those time programs. Has expired. Senator Davey, second supplementary. Uh, so, what does the rural financial counselling service say to the current 130 small business clients that they are going to be unable to assist post maybe 31st of March 2023, which was not in the budget, and who will provide advice to? Um, these businesses in West Wyalong local government area and others like that. Thank you, Senator Davey. Minister. Thank you, President. Senator Davey, it's obviously a matter for each of those services to decide what they want to say to their clients. But one thing they might say is that isn't it good that we had a government that extended our funding beyond the 31st of December this year? Because, of course, that was the situation that your government left them in, that the funding was going to cut out at the 31st of December this year. You might have forgotten about it, but your government had a budget back in, I think it was March or April this year, and decided to not extend the funding. And now you want to come in here and say why, we're, why we haven't provided funding funding any more long term than what you did. We've actually extended this funding beyond what your government had agreed to to the 31st of March this year because we do recognise that these people need some certainty. Your government decided that it was going to cut out the funding right in the middle of the disaster season. That's how much you cared about those services. We've actually taken a different view, provided that certainty, and as I say, there is an ongoing program for rural financial counselling for farmers. There is no risk to that whatsoever. And in the meantime, we are considering other options for financial counselling for businesses to go with the uh, grants that have already Thank been approved you, for those Your small time businesses. Has expired, Senator Lambie. Thank you, Madam President. My question is for the Minister representing the Minister of Defence, Minister Wong. Last week it was revealed that the Chief of Defence Force, General Angus Campbell, has given officers of Special Operations Task Group 28 days to provide reasons for why they should not have to return any honours they received throughout service in Afghanistan. This order applies to officers of the ranks of captain and brigadier. It excludes officers of the rank of major general. How convenient. One officer of the rank of major general who was in the headquarters responsible for the special operations task group, who received a distinguished service cross for his service, was now General Angus Campbell. Does the minister support there being one rule for the higher ups and one rule for the rest? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Wong. Uh, thank you, uh, President. Um, uh, this, is obviously, this obviously goes to the implementation of the Brereton report, which contained uh, 143 recommendations, many of which were resolved by the previous government. The Deputy Prime Minister has instructed Defence to detail a pathway for closing out the remaining 42 recommendations. One of the outstanding recommendations is the one referenced in Senator Lambie's question, which is, deals with the review of the award of decorations to those in command position at uh, positions at troop, squadron and task group level during particular special operations task group rotations. Um, uh, I am advised uh, that the Chief of Defence Force has written to a small number of people. Obviously, I don't propose to comment on the outcome of each of those particular uh, considerations. Uh, uh, I would make the point um, that uh, the, um, the government's focus is on implementing the Brereton recommendations. The Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Defence, in relation to the last part of your question, uh, Senator Lambie, uh, Mr Miles has stated that there is no cause to extend the parameters of the recommendation. Uh, and where the government, or where the CDF has acted, it is because there is an evidence-based reason to do so. Uh, the government remains committed uh, to uh, uh, ensure that the outstanding recommendations of the Brereton report are appropriately acted upon. Uh, I'm advised the CDF is seeking to do that uh, where there has been a detectable pattern of behaviour underpinned by credible reports of misconduct by ADF personnel in Afghanistan. I'm also advised this applies to a very small number of people. 
Thank you, Senator Wong. Uh, Senator Lambie, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, Madam President. The officer of special investigator is investigating soldiers while the, whole com while the high commanders are protected by what the Afghanistan Inquiry Oversight Panel calls a blanket exemption from liability. Given the extent of findings that have led to this punitive action, does the minister believe this blanket exemption remains appropriate? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, President. Thank you to Senator Labby, and I, I do acknowledge her ongoing you know, focus on not only these issues but the issues of uh, the welfare of serving and um, previously serving personnel. Uh, the focus the government uh, and, as I'm advised, the CDF are taking are um, to implement the uh, Brereton report recommendation. Uh, the uh, parameters of those recommendations were obviously a matter for, for the, uh, uh, the, for, for the Burton uh, report, uh, and uh, the Deputy Prime Minister has, as I said, stated that the government does not believe there is cause to extend the parameters of uh, the recommendations. Uh, you know, we, we are committed uh, to implementing the report to the fullest extent possible. We understand this is a difficult issue, uh, but one that uh, DPM has made clear uh, our commitment Thank you, to Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Lambie, second supplementary. The blanket exemption has been criticised on both its grounds and its effects by, by a number of well-credentialed experts in this space. If the Chief of Defence Force can decide to demand the return of medals, who has the authority to decide whether to demand the return of his? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Wong. Um, uh, the advice I have is um, a defence honour may only be cancelled by the Governor-General, uh, um, that uh, the process would be that uh, in relation to any, uh, any such cancellation, that the relevant minister would make a recommendation to the Governor General for to cancel such an honour. Uh, but I again make this point, uh, uh, and I don't intend to get into uh, personal um, reflections on anybody. Uh, that the government's view uh, and the CDF's actions are, cons are consistent with this is that the uh, recommendations of the Brereton report uh, uh, should be acted upon. Uh, the CDF's actions are consistent with uh, the government's policy position. Thank you, Minister. Senator O'Neill. Thank you, um, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Can the Minister update the Senate on some of the challenges facing the country and how the government is responding with responsible economic management. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I thank Senator O'Neill and I acknowledge her um, length of service in the economic portfolio um, and uh, all the achievements she's made there. Um, this is an important question and the opportunity to update the Senate on global conditions impacting Australian households. Last week, the OECD released its updated outlook, which outlined some of those tough challenges ahead. The report showed that the global economy is experiencing the most profound energy crisis since the 1970s, while also dealing with the continued impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Russia's war in Ukraine is driving significantly higher energy prices all around the world. In the report, the OECD is predicting global growth to slow from 3.1 per cent to 2.2 per cent next year. We know that the economic pressures coming at us from around the world are felt most acutely around the kitchen table. Australian households are more exposed to those, these global conditions than they should be due to the wasted decade of the Liberals and Nationals government's policy failures. While the government cannot control many of the global pressures that will impact on Australian households, we are working to clean up the mess left behind by those opposite and take control of what we can. We are responding to the legacy of a wasted decade in energy, in skills, in pr productivity and in real wages growth. But we're taking a responsible approach. That's why our budget was the most responsible budget in years, returning 99 per cent of the tax revenue upgrades over the next two years to the budget, in comparison with the Liberal and Nationals average of around 40 per cent. 
This is responsible budget management that prevents no extra pressure on inflation, and we are absolutely determined to get wages moving again because we know a strong economy has to mean strong wages for workers, otherwise the economy is not delivering for the working people like it needs to. Thank you, Minister. Senator O'Neill, first supplementary. Thank you very much, Minister, for your kind words and for your excellent response about responsible economic management. Uh, can the minister, uh, responsible economic management, can the minister outline what assessment the International Monetary Fund recently made of the government's economic management? Thank you, Senator O'Neill, Minister. Um, President, I thank Senator O'Neill for the supplementary. And yes, I can. The IMF's recent statement confirms that the Albanese Labor government's budget was responsible, right for the time, and readies Australia for the future. This is a ringing endorsement of the government's approach to responsible economic management. The IMF states that the government's near-term fiscal restraint will support mon monetary policy in addressing demand pressures. This is an endorsement of our fiscal strategy, which puts a premium on restraint. As a result of our spending discipline, payments it will fall in real terms over the next two years, and real spending growth averages just 0.3% over the forward estimates. The October budget introduced responsible spending measures to provide cost of living relief, alleviate skill shortages, promote productivity growth and facilitate the climate transition. The IMF notes that the budget streamlining of spending should help to avoid adding to aggregate demand pressures in the economy. Thank you, Minister. Senator O'Neill, second supplementary. Thank you, Minister. And can you also detail what the IMF had to say about the government's plan to boost inclusion, to encourage female workforce participation, and to tackle skill shortages? Thank you, Senator O'Neill, Minister. Thank you, President. I thank again Senator O'Neill for that excellent question. Under those opposite, our economy wasn't delivering like Australians needed it to. The IMF praised the government's policy that tackles skill shortages and boosts workforce participation, including key outcomes of the Jobs and Skills Summit. Our budget delivered quality investments in the capacity of the Australian economy and the capabilities of the Australian people. This includes our fee-free TAFE and more university places, delivering cheaper childcare for 1.26 million families, expanding paid parental leave to 26 weeks for working parents. And the, IMF, uh, the IMF's independent assessment confirms that despite a difficult international outlook and significant economic and budget challenges here at home, Australians should be optimistic about the longer-term future of our economy and our country. Thank you, Minister. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, President. So, President, my question is to the Leader of the Government in the Senate, yeah. Senator Wong. I refer to the proposed parliamentary sitting schedule for 2023 yeah. that has been widely distributed by the Government no. and which shows that the Government wants to scrap additional budget estimates for early next year, a departure, a departure from practice in place since the 1990s. Minister. When Labor was elected, the Prime Minister said the Australian people deserve accountability and transparency. Why then is this government scrapping additional estimates and reducing Senate estimates scrutiny from the conventional four weeks in a normal year to just three weeks? Uh, order, order, order. I have not yet called the minister. We are fortunate that Senator Birmingham has a loud and clear voice because it was very hard to hear the question from the interjections. Minister Wong. Were you I didn't say much. Senator Mackenzie, I've just brought the chamber to order. Minister. Well, I, I do love a question on accountability and transparency from the coalition. And I particularly love it on a day that we know that the House is, is, going, is, is, going to, is preparing this week uh, to debate a censure of your former leader for the, 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 you know, the, the double-up ministers that he's Order. invented. Uh, and I'm asked a question by a man who probably knew about Mr Taylor, right. Mr Taylor covering up the price increase ahead Order. of the election. Where was your interest? Order. Where was your interest then, Senator Birmingham? Where was your interest then, Order. Senator Birmingham? Senator Wong. Senator Wong. Order. Order on my right and left. I have a senator on her feet. Order. 
Senator O'Neill, Senator Billick, Senator Billick and Senator Ayres. Order. Senator Mackenzie. Uh, thank you, Madam President. On relevancy point of order, uh, the minister has gone thank nowhere you. near accountability and transparency. Thank you, Senator from, from, from. Thank you. Sorry, Order. I haven't finished. Thank you, Senator Mackenzie. Oh. Please, thank, uh, Senator Mackenzie. Senator Mackenzie, it is not a debating point. You raised your point. Senator Mackenzie, you're not in a debate with me. You raised a point of order. I asked you to resume your seat. That is what I expect you to do. I will draw uh, Minister Wong to uh, the substantive nature of Senator Birmingham's well, question. Well, thank you. Thank I was responding to the request to talk about transparency and accountability, and uh, you know, de de oh, well, isn't it interesting? You know, he's all of a sudden now he's on the other side of the table. He was happy uh, to to protect Senator Mackenzie. He was happy. Uh, he's happy not to condemn. Uh, the uh, former not. Prime Minister. He's happy to defend Mr Taylor uh, hiding a price increase in electricity before the election. All of Order. those things he's happy to Order. do, but now he cares about Senator Estimates. If the, if, the, if, the, if, the, if the Leader of the Opposition uh, would like to have a look at what is actually happening, Senator you're Hume. Still, you've still got Senator, Senator Estimates Hume. going. We've still got Senator Estimates going. We've still got Last night, last night, Senator Gallagher uh, was again uh, there answering Senator Hume's question. There was an air of great repetition to them, but we're very happy to keep answering the oh, same no. questions over and over Senator again. Wong. Senator Wong, Senator McGrath. A point of order on relevance. Uh, the question went to the, the sitting schedule in relation to uh, estimates being reduced by 25 per cent. And Minister Wong has gone nowhere near uh, the estimates schedule. I don't think she's uh, mentioned you, the minister's Senator mentioned McGrath, the question, estimates at all. Thank you, Senator McGrath. The question also contained other elements, which uh, the minister has gone to. Um, I'll remind her of the question, and she has 14 seconds left. Thank S you, Minister Thank you. Wong. The, the Senate, Senate would, will be aware that we have just delivered a budget. Estimates hearing have followed that. Spillover hearings are continuing this week. There will obviously not be a MIEFA, so there will not be estimates after that. Uh, but we are very happy to keep Thank doing you, endless Wong. estimates if those opposite wish. Senator Birmingham, first supplementary. Senator Wong. Please resume your seat. Order. I have called your leader to ask his first supplementary. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, President. Will the government drop its outrageous proposal to cut Senate estimates in 2023 by a full week and instead commit to programming additional estimates hearings early next year? as has been the practice on both sides of this parliament for decades? Or is the government's assurances of transparency and accountability just another broken promise? Another Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Order, order, order. Uh, Minister. As I've said, uh, I understand uh, that uh, the uh, proposal involves a recognition that we have just had a budget, therefore we are, there is not intended to be a MIEFO. Uh, it is usual that additional estimates would follow MIEFO. So, so, so uh, I, I, I understand that uh, you know, it, I would anticipate that the usual pattern of budget MIEFO with additional and supplementary and budget estimates would be returned to uh, when, when uh, the, uh, the you know, post and the election we set ill into uh, the normal MIEFO and budget uh, uh, process. But again, I say, no one, on, uh, uh, no one in this place, I suspect even on that side, Order. believes it when you talk about transparency, Senator Birmingham, because we lived through nine years, nine years your government, uh, your government refusing to legislate you, Minister, an anti-corruption commission. Minister Wong, your time has expired. Senator Birmingham, second supplementary. Thank you, President. The government's proposed sitting schedule for 2023 also proposes four additional Senate-only sitting days on a Friday. However, 
The Senate standing orders provide for no established routine of business on a Friday. In the interests of accountability and transparency, Senator Wong, will the government commit to having a question time on any scheduled Friday sittings? Thank you, uh, Senator Birmingham. Minister Wong. Thank you, President. Well, we, we will work with the Senate. We will, we will work with the Order. 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 Senator Birmingham has just completed a question. The minister was on her feet answering it, and I've had to immediately call you to order. Minister. Uh, of course we will work with the Senate on how Fridays would be arranged, just as we have worked with the opposition uh, and the crossbench on how we would deal with this sitting week and as we dealt with last six of the week. No, so, uh, well, Senator, Senator Birmingham, uh, you know, Senator Gallagher has been very consultative, including with your colleague, uh, on Friday sittings this week. I would anticipate Order. the same degree of consultation would be engaged in Order. by the government, which of course is very different to what we saw from those opposite when in government. And on that basis, President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Thank you, Minister. Can I ask senators if, they, if they're wishing to leave the chamber to do so expeditiously? Order, it's not a social occasion. Senator Smith, do you seek the call? Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to take note of answers given by Senator Gallagher in response to my question on the performance of the Assistant Treasurer. But before I do that, I think it's very, very important to recognise this very, very important and momentous occasion. The government has surrendered on its commitment to transparency and scrutiny. What we just heard in the final question asked by Senator Birmingham was the revelation that many of us caught a glimpse of this morning, that the government has decided that it will not put itself to the normal test of scrutiny that other governments have put themselves to for two to three decades. What we're talking about here is the decision of the government to take out of the parliamentary program four days of budget estimates. That is almost 60 hours of scrutiny, 60 hours of scrutiny that the opposition and other senators, other non-government senators, can put the government through. The first time in almost 30 years that the government has consciously decided to remove itself from scrutiny. This is perhaps the most remarkable re re revelation in the six-month history of the government so far. Now, of course, there is a get-out-of-jail clause. There is a get out of jail clause for the government, Senator, and, that is, point of order. and that is that it's a draft program. Um, Deputy President, my understanding was that Senator Smith rose to take note of the question that he asked Senator Gallagher. He's now floating off into the question that Senator Birmingham asked Senator Wong. So I would draw you back to whatever he's going to talk about. Senator Smith, I do have to draw you back to uh, your original motion, which was in relation to the answer given by Senator Gallagher. Senator Urquhart is 100 per cent correct. 
but it was such an important revelation that I thought I should, <laughs> that I should, I, that I thought I should to indulge. Death, but not necessarily important Thank to the deputy president. Much. So then, so then, so then, if that wasn't enough, if that wasn't enough, <laughs> if that wasn't enough, today, today, sorry, Senator Lambio. Of course, the other significant matter in question time today was a question that I asked, an issue that was actually canvassed yesterday in the Senate by coalition senators, and that is the appalling performance, the appalling performance thus far of the assistant treasurer, Mr. Stephen Jones. Now, normally, normally in government, if you made one mistake, that would be serious enough for a reprimand from the Prime Minister, reprimand from the Treasurer. But no, the Assistant Treasurer has not made one mistake, has not made two mistakes, has made three mistakes. And all we got from Senator Gallagher, who represents both the Treasurer and the Assistant Treasurer in the Senate, was a statement, a reflection on her personal relationship with Mr Jones. And I don't doubt, I don't doubt that there's a long history there. But the critical point that we were examining in question time today is whether or not the Assistant Treasurer has the character, has the integrity, has the professional skill to be responsible for, to have management and oversight over the financial services portfolio. And I think it's clear the revelation that Senator McKim had given to this chamber last week makes it very, very clear, very, very clear that the Assistant Treasurer does not have the character or the integrity in order to manage what is a very, very significant portfolio. It's worth reminding the chamber that a newspaper report in the Sydney Morning Herald noted when talking about the Financial Accountability Regime Bill, noted that Mr Jones had said that there had been no sign-off on anything, had been no sign-off on anything. There had been no deal, Mr Jones is quoted as saying in the Sydney Morning Herald. But last week, Senator McKim, again in the chamber, made it very clear. He said, there is absolutely no doubt that Minister Jones and I had an agreement and any claim that there was no agreement is false. That is a significant revelation in this place by Senator McKim about his dealings, his negotiations with Stephen Jones. That is an unacceptable, unacceptable way in which the Assistant Treasurer dealing with some very, very important legislation. And I would go to so far as to say that the greatest bulk of bills that have passed through the Senate since we came back after the election have been Treasury and financial bills. Have been Treasury and financial bills. Their careful management, careful negotiation is central to the well-being of Australians and their families. And we have Senator McKim calling out the fact that the Assistant Treasurer cannot be trusted with his word on important Thank you, matters. Smith. Senator Smith. Well, this is a really disappointing decline into a pretty horrific personal attack on a member of the government who I think is doing a tremendous job. And the idea that we have in this chamber uh, an attack on the basis of accountability, on the basis of transparency, and indeed, Senator Smith, an attack on the basis of acting in good faith, I think is pretty appalling. Uh, this assistant treasurer, our assistant treasurer, Stephen Jones, has been fighting day and night for the same things we are all fighting for on this side of the chamber, the same things which keep us up at night, how to deal with the cost of living crisis in Australia, fighting to do things like deliver cheaper childcare, to deliver cheaper medicines, to deliver real action to increase wages, including through our secure jobs bill. That is what our government is focused on. That is the work which keeps us up at night, and I know that is the work that our assistant treasurer is working on day in, day out. And from a government, from a government who had a history over nine years 
of dodging transparency, of dodging accountability from the Prime Minister, whose most famous legacy quote is, I don't hold a hose, mate. That's the government Senator Smith served in. That is their record on accountability and transparency. That is their record. So pretty outrageous to come in here, not only to smear and attack a member of the other place, but to do so on the basis of accountability, on the basis of transparency, on the basis of acting in good faith. I mean, it's, I, I don't know how you keep a straight face through that one. Honestly, honestly, and you can't, you can't. How do you keep a straight face through that one? You can't. The government is not focused, is, is not focused on these ridiculous smears. We're focused on getting on with the job of action on cost of living. Cheaper childcare, January 1. We will see childcare get cheaper in this country to make sure more mums and dads can get back to work. Cheaper medicines. Real measures which will take the cost of living burden off Australian families. This is what people in our communities are talking about. These are the kind of measures that Australians want to see. Most importantly, they want to see action on their wages. They want to see after, after a, a, when the previous government designed our economic architecture to have wages deliberately low, well, they want to see a shift in that. They want to see us move away from that. And fair enough. And that's what we're doing as a government. That's what we are getting on with. So to come in here and, and make some kind of artificial argument about transparency and accountability, I think it's pretty hard to do that and keep a straight face. And to keep a straight face. Um, we have just seen the government deliver a budget which not only fulfills our election commitments but contains key, key measures to address and tackle cost of living, in addition to what I've already spoken about, about cheaper childcare and about cheaper medicines. We are progressively expanding paid parental leave to six months by, by 2026, another measure which will make a real difference to Australian families. More affordable housing, including a new national housing accord to build more affordable and well-located homes for Australians. And of course, getting wages moving again. And I know Assistant Minister Jones, I know he, like every member of our government, every member of the Albanese Labor government cabinet is working day in and day out to achieve these objectives. Because when we came to government, we did so on a promise to the Australian people that we would take real action to, to address the cost of living crisis, that we would be, yes, a government which was more transparent, which was more accountable. I mean, let's not forget that in the other place this week, we expect the Prime Minister will be the subject of a motion regarding his, his decision to swear himself into multiple other ministries. And I note Senator Smith said that, um, that the Assistant Treasurer should be reprimanded by the Prime Minister and the Treasurer. I mean, ridiculous, but I guess at least if he was a member of the former government, that person would be the same person. I mean, it's, it's just outrageous that you had a Prime Minister take these decisions, do these things, you all sat elderly by, by that, and then you come in here months later on this accountability and transparency uh, attack, which I just don't know how you do with a straight face. You don't believe you, in it. Senator you don't Smith. believe the words Senator, you are saying. Senator Bragg. Uh, Deputy President, and it's a real pleasure to be able to make a contribution uh, in relation to the government for vested interests and its latest uh, foray uh, into financial regulation. Uh, if you are a class action law firm or you are a union or you are a super fund, uh, you are at the top of the list on the government for vested interests priority list. Uh, if you're a punter, uh, you go to the back of the queue uh, because this government is only interested in feathering the nests of vested interests. And that is the log of claims that this minister, Mr Jones, has been working through since he assumed his role over six months ago. And we saw uh, over the last few days, Mr Swan, who is the president of the Labor Party, but also the head of the Seabus Super Fund, uh, say that he was going to commit $500 million of the members' money to a housing accord, which Senator Gallagher said, Senator Estimates, she didn't even know the detail of. So you've got a housing accord policy 
uh, with no detail, uh, no assurance to the trustees about how their money uh, would be protected, and you've got the person wearing two hats in Mr Swan falling over himself to promise the members money. Uh, and that is, of course, the best example that I can think of of the howling conflicts which sit, which sit uh, at the very heart of this government for vested interests. But of course, Senator Smith's contribution here is about Mr Jones. And Mr Jones has already had a, uh, a quadrilla of failures in his attempt to regulate the financial markets or fail, fail to attempt to regulate the financial markets. And uh, last Friday, we heard from Senator McKim, who had been done over by Mr Jones. He goes over to the other ministerial wing and uh, does a deal which falls over pretty quickly. And of course, Mr Jones has, as a result of the deal falling over, has killed his own financial regulation uh, agenda, uh, which is designed to improve the penalties which are applied to members of the financial sector who breach our laws. So that's fallen over. So is the compensation scheme of last resort, uh, which Mr Jones promised at the last election. Uh, and so that is now on the never-never, that we might not see that again. Uh, and then, of course, yesterday in this chamber, his uh, critical policy, Mr Jones's key policy that he took to the election, the religious carve-out for super funds, massive issue, huge issue out there in the community. And uh, that was the centrepiece of his policies. And yesterday, uh, that was excised by the government, removed from the bill before the, House, before the Senate. Uh, and of course, we've also been able to canvass Mr Jones's failure to regulate the crypto sector. Uh, back on the 22nd of August, Mr Jones said in a Treasury media release that he was about to release a public consultation on token mapping quote unquote, will be released soon. That was on the 22nd of August. Meanwhile, you've had the FTX collapse uh, and you've had other consumers exposed, 30,000 Australian consumers exposed to FTX. And what do you hear from Jones? Nothing, nothing from Mr Jones. So he's failed to protect consumers, of course, there because there are probably no vested interests going into his office asking him to do things. Which takes me to uh, the last point about Mr Jones's tremendous record here as the minister. Of course, his first act as minister was to remove transparency arrangements which would require the funds to show how much money they've sent off to a related party, be it a union or a bank or an insurance company or any related party. And he's taken that away. That was his first priority. He comes into the job and he says, OK, I've got a great plan here. I'm going to take away the transparency that has been put in place because I don't want workers to see where their money is going. And so that is, that is that is his priority. That tells you all you need to know about this minister. And in terms of that particular regulation, I mean, tomorrow I know that Senator Lambie has a disallowance and the chamber will be able to make its own judgment about whether or not it thinks that Mr Jones's judgment that the Australian people and Australian workers and members of super funds should not be allowed to see when their funds are sending their money off to the CFMEU and to the Australian uh, Workers' Union and all the other unions which benefit greatly from the superannuation funds. So it is a shocking tenure already for Mr Jones. He's fluffed the, the FAR bill. Uh, the religious carve-out is already dead. And tomorrow he might, in fact, complete his trifecta and he might lose his super regs. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. Uh, and. Uh, I, uh, I thank Senator Dean Smith uh, for his question to Senator Gallagher, to the minister, um, about uh, our very important financial accountability uh, regime uh, package. Uh, and this indeed is a, a package of reforms that uh, I am very proud uh, to support. Uh, and it's a package of reforms uh, that the government remains uh, committed to passing. Uh, and we make absolutely no apologies uh, for being a government uh, that is willing to uh, consult with the, the sector uh, about this package of reforms. Uh, this is uh, an incredibly important uh, part of our financial architecture. Uh, and it's a part of our financial architecture uh, 
uh, that the previous government, the uh, now opposition, completely walked away from. Uh, this package of reforms includes uh, reforms to the accountability for banks uh, and financial services providers uh, and includes um, strong penalties. Uh, it includes a compensation scheme of last resort for victims of uh, financial companies who refuse or can't pay determinations for compensation for victims of, of wrongdoing. Uh, and critically, it includes reforms to payday lending laws, laws and consumer lease laws uh, to get rid of predatory lending uh, in our country uh, that just heaps debt onto vulnerable people. Uh, so again, we remain committed to passing uh, this legislation. Uh, and when it comes to financial architecture in this country that protects uh, consumers, uh, it is quite uh, extraordinary that the opposition would come in here uh, and try to claim any moral high ground whatsoever when it comes to this issue. Uh, this is an opposition that voted, I think it was 26 times, against the Hain Royal Commission uh, into the banking sector. Uh, and these reforms that we are continuing to consult about actually come out of that Royal Commission. Uh, they also come out of the Small Amount Credit Contracts Review, um, which highlighted uh, the absolutely tragic consequences of predatory lending. Uh, but of course, those opposite chose not to pass this package of reforms. Uh, they chose not to try to protect consumers. Uh, they chose uh, not to fully implement the Hain Royal Commission uh, recommendations or the SAC recommendations. Uh, and instead, they've come in here uh, and attempted to heap uh, criticism on us for introducing this incredibly important legislation. Uh, and also for consulting widely on it. Uh, what we are doing is getting on with reforms that protect consumers in this country. Uh, what we are doing is getting on with implementing the Hain Royal Commission uh, in full. Uh, and uh, what we are doing uh, is getting on with being a government that is restoring uh, integrity um, to our uh, political system uh, and to our government. Uh, and I do want to note uh, the comments of Senator Dean Smith uh, in his take note speech, uh, who directly called into doubt the integrity of the minister uh, with his words. Uh, and that was uh, a completely unwarranted attack. Uh, and I think it was an attack uh, that was quite frankly um, beneath the standards of Senator Dean Smith. Um, who I work with on the Senate Economics Committee uh, and who I've generally found to be a very collegiate um, and reasonable person uh, as we do our work, um, work like considering this particular package of reforms. Um, so I do have to say that I'm incredibly uh, disappointed with the approach of Senator Smith uh, in this chamber today. Uh, and uh, there is absolutely nothing wrong with introducing a package of reforms that go to the heart of protecting consumers in our country from financial wrongdoing. Uh, and there is absolutely nothing wrong um, with consulting widely on those reforms and taking feedback as feedback arises. Uh, nothing wrong with talking to the crossbenchers um, about the reforms and making sure that they're fit for a purpose uh, and they do the job. Uh, Minister Jones is getting on with doing the job, delivering the financial architecture that our country needs, uh, and he will continue to do that work. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Senator Cadell. Mr Deputy President, Australian businesses make billions of dollars worth of investment decisions every day. And to do this, they need certainty. To do this, they need consistency. And to do this, they need reliability in the economy and the hands that steer them. That's why Senator Dean Smith's questions today are so important for the Australian economy. Today in the question by Senator Smith, we heard the challenge the Assistant Treasurer's actions have caused to this. I don't think it was assessing his merits or his integrity. It is just the potential damage that inconsistency can cause to the economy. I note that the Assistant Treasurer is the Minister for Whitlam. And we've noted that just in three days, some of those opposites will be celebrating 
50 years since Mr Whitlam took office. Well, in 72 it was potentially time, and in 22 potentially the minister's time is up. We've had the three strikes, we've had the problems with all the areas they've spoken at earlier, and business needs better. The economy needs better. Australian households need better. I noted in the response by Minister Gallagher that the Assistant Minister was an outstanding person. There is no question of that. We're not questioning his uh, personality. We're not testing his character. He may be no doubt. He may be the Keanu Reeves of this parliament, for all I know. I don't meet him. He may pet dogs and work at a pound and look after cats. No one is questioning his personality, merely his competency and his ability to see things through. But we get back to the point. Business needs an economy with confidence and that when the government shakes a hand, when the government nods ahead, when the government says yes, they get a deal that sticks. When we go into a business case, when we've sat in a boardroom, I've sat there trying to diversify a business to make it more resilient to look to the future. When we're looking at billions of dollars worth of investment, you look at millions of dollars of consultants, millions of dollars of man hours, you look at tens and tens of, of people looking to make this investment. Now what have we got? We've got uncertain. We've got a, an assistant treasurer that can change his mind on regulation, that can say stuff that you may rely on that is incorrect. We have interest rates going up. We have cost of living going through the roof. The economy is not stable at the moment and inconsistencies in messaging from the government heard it. We heard from Senator Bragg some of the areas that came up uh, where there's been a flip-flop or a change. Talk about cryptocurrency, getting involved in there, regulation around that. There are people, there was an article today where a couple are losing $50,000 in superannuation for a lack of regulation in the cryptocurrency space. You know, that lack of certainty is going to hurt them personally. It's going to hit budgets all across Australia when they do that. We heard about the super disclosure laws being wound back. And people deserve to know Every time they do this, they think a union does that and they think the Labor Party does that. People need consistency. They need to know that is not the case. And we talked about bank penalties, bank penalties being wound back for things. Now, what is that about? It's like an episode of rake. Was the shadow minister scared the banks were going to close his bank accounts and he was going to have to go to parliamentary friends of breakfast to get a meal around here? But we flicked back on the bank episode here. All of these things are not good, they are not consistent, and they do not give confidence to the economy. And that's before we even get to mums and dads looking at their consistency, their certainty. They went into an election hearing $275 worth of savings, and that has evaporated. They are doing their budgets, and we have had nine, eight or nine interest rate rises since this government has been elected. The cash rate is now more than eight times higher than when this government got elected. There is no consistency. There is no steady hand. We deserve better. The Australian people deserve better. And the assistant treasurer just needs to get it right. If he doesn't need to go, he needs to get it right because the people deserve that. Thank you, Mr. I put the question. Those for the question say aye against uh, you. Senator Lambie, you're seeking the call. Yeah. In relation to. Well, I rise Senate. to take note of answers. Thank you. Uh, to the to the to the one moved by Senator Dean Smith, or have you got other answers you wish to make it? Wish to move. No, to my question. Okay. So I just let you Sorry. put the motion, and Sorry. then I'll give you the call. I put the question to, to the motion moved by Senator Dean Smith. Those for the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Senator Lambie. Thank you. Thank you. I, did, I missed that step. I do apologise. At the start of this month, the Chief of Defence Force, Angus Campbell, gave a group of Special Forces officers 28 days to explain why their service should still be considered distinguished and worthy of the medal they were awarded for their achievements within the Special Operations Task Group in Afghanistan. The majority of these officers received their awards for their leadership in action on foreign ground, facing the enemy and leading their men in combat. We have only heard about this because many of these officers have reached out, needing help to bring this to the public's attention. The CDF himself has apparently asked some of these men 
to voluntary for, to voluntarily hand back their awards, and if they don't, he said he will seek a mechanism to do so through the Governor General, through the force of threat. This is the same Chief of Defence Force who, two years ago, off the back of the Brereton report, called to remove the meritorious unit citation from every single Special Forces person, including their support staff. The Chief of Defence Force is making these decisions and taking actions while, happily while he happily continue to wear his own Distinguished Service Cross. His citation reads, and I quote, awarded for his command and leadership in action, in, unquote. While the commander of Joint Task Force 633, when he was a general responsible for all Australian troops deployed to the Middle East, including Afghanistan, sitting comfortably in his office outside Dubai for the majority of those two years, mind you. Well, I tell you what, mate, it's time to cough up your own award first, buddy. How about you start showing some leadership? If I could just see some out of you, just a little bit, just a little bit before you're just about gone and disposed, I reckon, and stop passing the buck down here. Stop passing it down to the diggers, mate. Show some leadership. Pass yours in first. Let's see what you've got. I can tell you this was explained to me by one of the Special Forces officer friends as the exact command responsibility the Chief of Defence Force is citing as a reason why the other lower-ranking Special Forces officers should hand back their awards. The Chief of Defence Force has lost the support of the majority of the military. Perhaps not so much his little group of senior officers that still surround him waiting for their day of promotion and all the brass up in his headquarters, but he has lost the, support, lost the support of most of the military. That is where we're at today. No support from junior ranks whatsoever. These are the ones that are doing the hard yards on the ground and who are the ones who actually and the ones actually out on missions winning their awards in action in combat. That's who they are. The discharge rates from the ADF are at an all-time high, and don't even talk to me about retention rates, they're finished. Recruitment is struggling at the best. Why would people, why would anybody want to join any organisation where this type, type of treatment can go unchecked against those who are subordinate in rank and restricted through strict policies of being unable to reach out of the system otherwise? Well, I say enough is enough. We are in Australia where we abide by the rule of law and give people a fair go. We saw a spike in veteran suicide and damage to our strategic reputation through the same man, the same man that has been given a tenure, an extended tenure for two years from Minister Richard Miles. What planet is he living on? That's your first and last mistake, I reckon, Minister. I sincerely do. Any respect you hope to get out of this has already gone, Minister Miles. You're finished gone. So I can tell you the CDF has proven that these decisions should not be left to him and I am calling for his actions to be immediately brought before the Senate Committee into Defence and Foreign Affairs in order to appropriately ensure the sensitive and strategic na nature of these issues are properly and publicly met. I can tell you now one of the reasons we are at a Royal Commission these suicides going on is because of that leadership. He has been part of that leadership for many, many, many years. Yet none of you in here, neither side of the majors, have had the guts to dispose of him. We have some serious issues going on in our military. Watch the Royal Commission because it's in front of our face. And when we have troops out there, where most of them, where their morale is down and out, that puts a strain on our national security. And that should be a red hot alert for all of us in here. It is time for leadership change in the military. Before the Royal Commission tells you, I will. Angus. Campbell has to go. Put the question. Those of the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Senator, Senator Wish Wilson, there's 30 seconds remaining. Do you wish to take note? Oh, I won't pass up 30 seconds. Just, I'd like to put on. I wish to take note in response to my questions. How disappointed I was that I didn't get a response from Senator Wong on whether the government will actually oppose a UNESCO World Heritage in Danger listing and the process that would lead to that. I sincerely hope that the government accepts the recommendation and that we put the politics behind us—ten years of shameful politics 
and that we work together to secure the future of the reef, for not just for future Australian generations, but for all generations. And I note uh, Senator Green, the envoy, is in the room, the Senate chamber today, and I hope she pays attention to what I've just said. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it.